All right, good evening, everyone. The May 13th, 2021 meeting of the Rent Control Board is called to order. Would the Secretary please take roll? Yes. Commissioner Tarosis. Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Phyllis. Here. Commissioner Foster. Here. Vice Chair Duran. Here. And Commissioner Tarosis and Chair Sultan are currently absent. I believe uh, Commissioner Tarosis will be joining us later. Okay. Very good. Thank you. I'm going to make just a general uh, announcement that anyone wishing to address the board on a specific item for tonight's agenda should have contacted the board secretary prior to the meeting. Um, we will recognize speakers and arrange to have them speak uh, when it is their turn in the queue. Having made that general announcement, I want to move to the approval of the minutes. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of the board's last meeting? Nope, never mind. Uh, so moved. Okay, very good. Do we, have, uh, um, do we have enough people to vote on this? Sorry, point point of order. Sorry, sorry. I I'm totally out of. I just have a, a question, I guess, for Allison because I wasn't here, and Steve and Anastasia were only here. We don't have a majority of the board, so I, I don't know. <laughs> you have a a, a quorum to proceed, and then you have majority of those present to pass the minutes. Okay, thank you. Very good. Thank you, Council. All right, there's been a first, and I will second um, the meeting minutes um, as written. Can we have a roll call uh, vote by the Secretary, please? Yes. Commissioner Phyllis. Yes. Commissioner Foster. Yes. And Vice Chair Duran. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to special agenda item number six. There will be any brief announcements, uh, anything of that sort. Yes, good evening, commissioners and members of the public who have joined us. I have several announcements this evening. First, I wanted to share the good news that with the continually improving uh, situation with respect to the coronavirus, we are working on a plan to reopen our public counter by appointment a couple of days a week. Um, we submitted our proposal for our plan to the city's emergency operations committee, and we will be working to finalize it soon. Uh, we're aiming for a reopening date in early June uh, with public counter services provided in a suite uh, near C City Hall East. Um, this is necessary because City Hall won't open until later in the summer, and we'd like to pr begin providing uh, public counter services in person as it seems that the health conditions will allow us to do that. Um, We'll be, once we have our plan approved, we'll uh, be working with the Office of Communications to get the word out to the public, and we'll look forward to meeting with people by appointment a couple of days a week to start. So we're aiming for June 1st, but it could be a week or so later. So we will announce that once we have a finalized plan. In the meantime, we'll continue to provide our mediation and hearing services via video conference until sometime later. I wanted to also mention that we held two very successful um, seminars at the end of April, both one for landlords and one for tenants. They were well, um, lots of participation in the virtual seminar and by the questions that were asked, it seemed that the attendees were uh, enjoying the information they were receiving and had some great questions. Both of those uh, seminars are now posted as videos on our website for anybody who's interested in watching them and wasn't able to attend. I want to thank Dan Costello, our public information manager, and the information coordinators and analysts who presented those seminars. 
I also want to mention and remind people that both the local eviction moratorium uh, for reasons other than non-payment of rent and the state eviction moratorium for non-payment of rent due to impacts of COVID-19 continue through June 30th. More information about both of those laws can be obtained by calling our office or by checking our website. We have links to a lot of helpful information there. Uh, also, as I've announced in the past few months, the rental assistance uh, program to help cover unpaid rent and utility costs for income-eligible Santa Monica households is available through the California COVID-19 Rental Relief Program. Um, in an announcement this week, Governor Newsom indicated um, he's recommending that the state contribute additional funds to this program and that the level of reimbursement be increased from 80% to 100% of unpaid rent. Those plans are preliminary at this point, um, and I will likely require approval by the legislature. There's more information about the program and applications for both landlords and tenants can be found at housingiskey.com. And finally, I want to mention that May is Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And our board secretary, Alvin Ho, has been working with a team from the city to organize a couple of celebratory events. So I've asked Alvin to inform the board and the community about next week's events. Alvin? Thank you, Tracy. Good evening, commissioners. I just wanted to share the two events that Hakka, myself, and other AAPI city staff have been volunteering our time with. Um, with the city council declaration, we were fortunate enough to organize a community forum that will take place next Wednesday, May 19th, from 6 to 8 p.m. Okay. It's a public forum that will feature our very own Haka Mordezai as a panelist and will be moderated by Jeff Nguyen of CBS2 and KCAL9. It's going to be a discussion on current events and historical challenges faced by the AAPI community and their experiences amid acts of hate during the pandemic. And then the next day on Thursday, May 20th, from 10.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m., there's going to be a virtual celebration planned that will feature some musical performances, uh, both traditional and modern, and some talks with AAPI creatives on their work. Uh, it also features some local groups and organizations. So it's going to be a fun event. I hope everyone has a chance to join and watch. Uh, registration is required for both events, and it's available on the city website at santamonica.gov under um, press releases. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, can I say something, Steve? Yes, Commissioner Tarosis, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Duran, for today. Um, First of all, uh, Mr. Ho, thank you so much for that update. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, this is a hugely important issue, and I love that there's a celebratory uh, spirit to this. Um, so just to clarify for the public who wants to join, it's smsantamonica.gov, you said? No, actually, the uh, new website is now santamonica.gov. santamonica.gov under press releases. Okay, I'm going to go find it. Um, thank you. And Tracy, uh, thank you so much for your update as well. And I have to say those seminars, um, fantastic job. And I know that people are already um, asking where they can access them. So putting them on the website, great idea, great job. I think that's fantastic. So uh, thank you all. Yeah, thank you to Mr. Costello for his work on the seminars and being sure that all of our website is up to date and has helpful information. Very good. Thank you. Uh, any other special agenda items? Director Condon? Okay. Very great. Then moving on to uh, public comment. This is uh, time set aside for members of the public to address the board on matters that are not included in the agenda, but that are within the board subject matter jurisdiction. Uh, the board cannot take any official action. Uh, at tonight's meeting regarding matters that are stated in the public uh, comment section. I don't believe that we have anybody in queue to speak um, in the public comment. Is that correct? That's correct. We have no public uh, comment tonight. Okay. 
um, then we will move uh, to our next item, which is administrative um, items. And uh, here, agenda. The first one we have administrative item 12A is announcement of the 2021 annual general uh, adjustment and consideration of imposing a dollar amount ceiling to the 2021 general adjustment. Are there any um, reports to be given? In my bedroom, on Hassan's side. I'm sorry, Tracy. I can't. Your 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 mic is on mute. Can anybody hear her? Uh, Tracy, your mic has been unmuted. Can, can you try speaking now? Can you hear me? There we go. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. It said unmuted for me, so sorry about that. Okay. Um, so under the rent control law, the general adjustment for a given year is equal to 75% of the change in the consumer price index for the Los Angeles area for the 12-month period between March of the previous year and March of the current year. Using that formula with the CPI for that period of 2.2%, 75% of that is 1.65%, and the charter provides that that's rounded to the nearest tenth, so the general adjustment will be 1.7% for 2021. The rent control law also provides that the board shall hold at least one public hearing uh, to consider whether from, and hear from the public about the possibility of applying a ceiling or maximum increase to the general adjustment. Using the formula provided by the Charter, this year the ceiling would be $39, $39 if the Board decided to impose a general adjustment. So this evening we are asking that you uh, vote to set a public hearing for June 10th to hear from the public about uh, opposing a $39 ceiling on the general adjustment. And that completes the staff report. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, commissioners, are there any comments, um, any discussion that you want to have at this point? I see uh, Commissioner Foster's raised her hand. Go ahead. Um, so just for members of the public who yeah. may not understand, we've had some emails in the past about um, landlords writing to us because of COVID, you know, high, slightly higher vacancies than normal. They wanted rules to be different on how much we could increase the rent. They wanted to increase more. And we had uh, notes from tenants over the past year saying, because of COVID and, I, and we've lost employment, um, couldn't we have it smaller or no rent increase? And uh, so I just wanted to take this brief opportunity, since we have such a short agenda, to remind everyone that this is in the charter. It's not at our discretion. This is actually based on a five-county uh, average of the CPI and is not something that we, as commissioners, decide. It's uh, a mathematical formula that is laid out in our charter. So this amount um, reflects uh, the the average of all of the reasonable operating expenses that most average buildings go through, and it has been time-tested over decades of data to show that uh, the formula does, in fact, reflect most changes. So just wanted to take that moment and move that we um, set for public hearing the proposed ceiling. Okay. Um Commissioner Trosis, do you want a second, or do you have a? Do you want to discuss? No, I just a point of clarification. Uh, are, were there no public comments on this item? That's correct. No public comment at this time. Okay, I, I I just want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to know what's being decided. Although I do agree with Anastasia that this is fairly straightforward, and we pretty much move this forward every year, so this is not controversial to me. But I I'm concerned because, as Anastasia mentioned, we usually do hear a lot of. Uh, public comment around this. So hopefully for next month, um, public will have the opportunity to weigh in. Um, I will second Anastasia, uh, Commissioner Foster's motion. 
Okay, uh, there's been a first and a second. Um, seeing no other discussion. Um, can we have a roll call vote? Yes. Commissioner Foster? Yes. Commissioner Tlotis? Yes. Commissioner Phyllis? Yes. And Vice Chair Duran? Yes. Okay. Okay, very good. Um, and moving on to item 12B, the fiscal year 2020, 2021 third quarter budget report. May we have a staff report, please? All right. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. All right. So the main purpose of tonight's study session is to review the proposed budget for fiscal year 21-22. Answer any of your questions, receive direction on any changes you'd like to consider, and then vote to set the budget, excuse me, for public hearing and adoption on June 10th. Before we do that, um, it's helpful to review the board's experience as of the third quarter of the current fiscal year. The board received a mid-year report in March, so tonight uh, we're just providing a brief update on this year's financial experience. Current projections show that by year-end, revenue is expected to be approximately $80,000 higher than the $5,225,000 originally anticipated. This variation is due primarily to higher registration fee collections and higher than anticipated interest earnings in the second quarter. It now appears that expenditures will be approximately $71,000 more than the adopted expenditures of $5,287,000. Savings of about $65,000 in the supplies and expenses category and $8,000 in capital outlay will offset the over-expenditures of approximately $144,000 in the salary and wages category for permanent employees, overtime, and as-needed expenses. The bottom line is that given the increased revenue projections, and even despite the increased expenditures, we anticipate the originally projected small deficit of $34,600 will be reduced to $25,700 by year end. The fourth payment to the city for the 2017 loan on the PERS prepayment will be transferred to the city at the end of the fiscal year. The written third quarter report provided details um, on some line items in which we're projecting over expenditures and others in which we project reduced expenditures, and rather than go over those, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about the third quarter report. Okay, thank and, you very much. Oh, okay, ahead. so not seeing any questions, we can move ahead to the uh, discussion uh, of the fiscal year 21-22 proposed operating budget. So I have a little PowerPoint here. Let's see if I can do this content sharing. Are you seeing my screen now? No, not yet. Do you see the screen now? Okay, yes. Okay. So, as I said, tonight's uh, study session provides an opportunity for the board to review the proposed fiscal year 21-22 budget before setting it for public hearing on June 10th. This is an informal discussion, so feel free to stop me with questions and comments as we go along. The rent control law provides that before July 1st of each year, the board must hold a public hearing and adopt an annual budget for the coming fiscal year. To finance the agency's reasonable and necessary expenses, the board changes, charges landlords an annual per unit registration fee. Owners who pay the fee on time and are in compliance with the law may pass through half of the fee to tenants as a monthly surcharge on their rent. The proposed budget represents our best estimate of the board's revenue and expenses for the coming year. Because the budget 
predicts future events. It's an educated prediction, but as always, we strive to be as accurate as possible while conservatively projecting likely income and expenses. The proposed operating budget for next year projects operating expenditures of $5,505,000 and revenue of $5,284,000, resulting in a projected deficit of approximately $221,000. Tracy, so can I say, are, are you meaning to advance the slides because it's still on the, or are you just Re yeah. Still on the cover slide, so I didn't know if you were right. No, I'm gonna. I was gonna advance it after this, but I oh, stopped okay. hearing because I it wasn't necessary. And I'm like, I wonder if it's just not going. All right, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, 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 no problem. Thank you. Um, so we are projecting, as I said, uh, this year's budget or the project next year's budget is based upon a again a hundred and ninety eight dollar registration fee. And despite the projected deficit, we're not recommending an increase in the fee this year as the board has sufficient reserves to cover the deficit. So this coming year will be another one of change for the agency. Fortunately, with LA County having moved into the yellow tier of recovery, we'll be able to resume providing some in-person services very soon, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. We're in the process of developing a plan to open our public counter by appointment a couple of days a week to start, and then hopefully increasing that as we move into the summer month. Until we identify a proper space to hold in-person mediations and hearings, we'll continue to conduct those via tele and video conference. Having recognized our ability to continue to provide services while our employees work remotely, and acknowledging some of the advantages of an improved work-life balance as a result of teleworking and to comply with public health requirements, both the city and agency will continue to support teleworking and it's likely we will have fewer people in the office at any time going forward. We've also made some modifications to our public counter and work areas to ensure proper social distancing and safety for both our staff and the public we serve. This year, we expect to implement our new property and rent tracking database system, the cost of which was allocated by the board with adoption of the fiscal year 1819 budget and which we've been working on in earnest since February of 2019. Once the database is implemented, our longtime IT staff member will retire. Last December, in collaboration with the city's information services department, we hired a technical services analyst who is now assisting with the development of the new system and he will maintain the system once it's implemented and the, our long-term IT person will retire. The, the technical services analyst will also support our document management system and other agency technology needs. The salary and all benefit costs associated with this position are now included in a new line item in the budget document. Now I'll return to sharing my screen. Are you seeing the screen now? Yes. Okay, thank you. So as in the current year, the board's fiscal year 21-22 budget reflects both operating expenses, which I'll speak about in a minute, and additional expenditures, including the continuing capital improvement project to replace the rent database, and a fifth payment on the loan that the board received from the city in 2017 to accelerate the paying down of the agency's unfunded pension liability. A previously planned additional PERS payment to further accelerate the paydown of the agency's unfunded pension liability will not occur. As part of their response to the city's pandemic-related financial situation, the city council extended this PERS accelerated plan from 13 to 15 years and deferred the planned payments for fiscal years 2021 and 2122. Before we look at the budget expenditures, I'd like to mention a couple of things about the agency staffing levels and review the goals we're proposing for the coming year. Again, feel free to stop me as we go along as this is informal. This chart shows the organizational structure of the agency. 
In a service organization like ours, our major resources are the people who provide services to the community and advise the board. In fiscal year 21-22, the agency will have 25 positions providing for the over period of overlap between the programmer analyst and technical services analyst, and this is represented by the green and purple box on the right side of the screen. Once the system is implemented and the program programmer analyst retires, will return to a 24-person staff. In addition to our permanent staff members, a few as-needed or temporary employees will continue to assist us as necessary. Although it's difficult to predict how petition filings will be affected by the improving health situation, there's a possibility that there's some pent-up demand for mediation and hearings to address tenant petitions related to maintenance conditions that tenants were reluctant to address over, over the past year because it meant having repair people in their units during the health emergency. Therefore, it's prudent to anticipate some need for as-needed hearing officer assistance. Additionally, a temporary employee will continue to assess the hearings department by handling many of the mediations related to decreased petitions and excess rent complaints. Now that the public information staff is for the division is fully staffed, we anticipate a reduced need, if any, for the assistance of a public or retired info analyst during the busy summer months. We've allocated $42,500 in the upcoming budget to cover the cost of as-needed employees. The next few slides address our goals for the coming year. And with the not-too-distant reopening of our public counter, we will balance in-person services and teleworking while ensuring the performance of essential functions, productivity, and the safety of our staff and the public. This includes ensuring that all staff and members of the public comply with the public health guidelines when conducting business with or for the board, thoughtfully using the board's resources to ensure continuity of operations, including adapting processes through the use of technology or other means as necessary to continue to provide the full range of the board's services, and continuing to use the board's website to provide information from our other government agencies that bears on the board's work or affects the board's constituents, including information about California's COVID-19 rent relief program. We also have the continuing goal of increasing efficiencies through the use of technology. First, we will be leveraging electronic communications, social media campaigns, and expanded email lists to continue to enhance and broaden our engagement with tenants and landlords. And the long-awaited implementation of the new property and rent tracking system will increase efficiencies and improve the user experience through expanded online filings and direct access for property owners to more rent control information about their properties. A web-based self-serve portal for landlords and tenants will improve access to property-specific documents and case management for petitions and applications. When the city is ready for implementation, we'll conduct constituent training in using the system to file forms and petitions, pay fees, and ac access documents in the agency's property site files. We will also expand access via our website portal to documents in the agency files, including current and historical board packets for public meetings. In the always important goal of ensuring compliance with the rent control law, we will plan for any possible changes in state laws that impact Santa Monica's rent control law, and will communicate those changes to tenants and property owners. We will also initiate civil actions as necessary to enforce compliance with the law, and will continue to pursue unpaid registration fee balances through collection activities and small claims court. We will also continue implementation of the agency's document retention schedule to facilitate responses to public records requests and eliminate outdated documents. We will continue to collaborate with other city departments on common goals um, to ensure property owners and tenants understand their rights, responsibilities, and obligations. And we will work with the information services to Department to ensure that rent control information, including forms, petitions, and videos, remain prominent 
and easy to access as the city continues with the redesign of the city's websites. And finally, we will prepare for change, staff changes. As I mentioned earlier, we will experience another retirement this year, and others will likely come in the next fiscal year. This means that our continued cross-training of existing staff, development of new skills, effective succession planning, and training of new staff will continue to be a priority in the coming year. So before I move on to expenditures, um, just check and see if you have any comments about the goals or any uh, suggestions you would have for changes. Um, I, I don't know, uh, Chair, Vice Chair Duran here. Do, is it okay if I of course, jump in? Go ahead. I don't think anyone's looking at my chats. Um, so in any event, uh, thank you, uh, Tracy, for putting that together. I think my questions are centered around, you know, we have maybe potentially this backlog of uh, cases or, um, you know, constituent inquiries, et cetera, I could see a situation where in June, um, you know, as we're lifting the moratoria that we are getting an influx in calls and questions. I just want to make sure that we are, have enough staff because, uh, you know, I'm not one to, to spend our money unwisely, but at the same time, I think 24 people for all of the work that's going on here um, is, is not very many. And as you say, you know, our, our, our service is, you know, client constituent engagement, um, and that's really where I think that we need to make sure that we're devoting a lot of our resources. So I just wanted to make sure you feel like you're appropriately resourced, and and I know we're in, you know, an uncertain budget situation, but at the same time, I just want to make sure we have the resources that we need. Yeah, well, I appreciate the question, and I can hear you. Okay. I just heard an echo, but um, we do feel that we have sufficient staff. Fortunately, this year we have a full public information staff. Uh, we have not had that in the past, and we've needed to have assistance from retired uh, personnel in that department. But this year, uh, we have everybody's trained up, and I think we're in good shape with respect to that. With the hearings, if it does turn out that we have more requested hearings than our current staff can handle, we're fortunate to have the assistance of a former staff member who has helped us out in the past when we have a higher demand for hearings than we can handle with our permanent staff. And he is available to assist us going forward. And for that reason, we do have the um, as-needed uh, expenditure of $42,500. And if we see that, you know, we're having a problem with that, we can revise the budget at a later time in the year. But I think um, until we really can evaluate how great that demand is, I think we are set. I think we have sufficient resources. Okay, I would just say that um, publicly on the record, obviously, Everyone knows that outreach, education, customer service, very high priorities for me as, as they are for everyone. And I would hate to be in a situation where um, we're having, you know, exorb, I don't want to say that, or we're having question, we're having trade-offs in, in staffing and or delays. Uh, and so I would just say, don't feel shy at least to come to us with, with that information if it so happens to be that we need additional help. Because I am, of course, just concerned about what's going to happen here in the next six months or so. Yeah, I appreciate that concern. And we are so fortunate in that people who have retired are often willing and able to come back. And so we do have a little depth there if we need to call on it. Um, but I, I share your concern, and we will be very attentive to that. Great. All right. So if there are no other questions, then we can talk a bit about the revenue. Um, I mean, I'm happy to talk about it specifically, or we can just address questions. Uh, the budget document itself is available to the public. You each received a notebook with the budget in it. And um, tonight is, you know, the opportunity to review it. So if you'd like, I can talk a bit about expenditures and then a bit about the revenue as well. If you could do that, that would be, that would be good, I think, for the public. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm going to... 
share my screen again um, with the moment. Sorry, is the expenditures on the election cost part of this, what we're going to talk about right now? Uh, yes, I will mention that. Great, great. Okay. So for the board members, um, in your budget books behind the proposed 21-22 agency budget, you'll find uh, the agency budget page. It has a bit more detail than the slide I'm showing. And uh, text within the budget, pages 2 through 16, itemizes each line item. And as I mentioned, this document is also available to the public through our website. So I'm going to discuss just a few specific items, and then Ms. Noseworthy and I will be happy to address any of your comments or questions. So the fiscal year 21-22 budget maintains the current operations of the agency. The budget includes funds for one to two board meetings per month and provision of the highest level of public service in, the, in our day-to-day -day operation. It includes funds for two newsletters and the summer mailing, plus an additional mailing to inform property owners and tenants about the enhanced services and processes that will be available through the new property and rent tracking system. We anticipate presenting five or six seminars throughout the year, including a new seminar on the rent tracking system's functionality. It's likely some seminars will be offered via video conference, which we found to be very successful with the seminars in late April. The proposed expenditure budget for the fiscal year in the right-hand blue column is $5,505,000. As I mentioned earlier, the major resources of the board are the people who provide services to the community and advise the board. The first line in this chart is staff salaries, deferred compensation, and other payouts provided by the memoranda of understanding with the board's bargaining units. This allocation also includes costs associated with the anticipated retirement that I've mentioned. The compensation and all benefit costs for the technical services analyst position, which we fund but is stationed in ISD, are covered in the new line item, the second line item. Compensation for the as-needed employees we've talked about earlier are reflected in the as-needed employees line item. Health insurance costs continue to rise with a projected increase of 8% as of January 2022. Some of the insurance costs are offset by employee contributions toward the cost of the premium for their selected health care plan. The retirement contributions in line 513000 are set at a contribution rate of just over 26% of staff salaries. And just as a reminder, the agency does not pay into Social Security for our employees so PERS is essentially the equivalent of Social Security for private sector employees. In the supplies and expenses section of the budget, I want to mention a couple of things. The city assesses the agency for various services, such as maintenance of office space and services provided by the Departments of Human Resources, Finance, Purchasing, Facilities Maintenance, and Information Services. You'll find details about these charges referred to as indirect costs on page 5 through 10 of the budget. The 296000 in this line represents no increase over last year's allocation and accounts for a $10,000 reduction from this fiscal year that addressed election overhead costs in 2020. Did you have questions about that, Commissioner Trosis? Yeah, I just, um, I guess the, I, well, so I was looking under like the supplies and expenses category. Um, do we think, I think you probably already went over this in another meeting, but um, I would assume that we had a lot of savings in conferences, meetings, travel, uh, as well as office supplies and potentially um, tele, I don't know, is it, is it more expensive, less expensive, or the same to have the rent control board meetings on blue jeans? Um, versus in the council chambers. Uh, and then finally for the election, I just, can you tell us if, they, if the costs were $14,000 greater than anticipated, why, why was that the case for the two rent control board seats? Well, 
I'll, I'll address the I'll last question the last. first. Okay, sorry, that was like a lot of questions. Yeah, that's okay. Um, and you may have to remind me, but so for the election costs, what I just referred to was just overhead costs. Um, but as you point out, we had higher than anticipated costs for the 2020 election. And that was in, we usually allocate $25,000 to the, uh, directly for the cost of elections in the fiscal years where we're having an election for board seats. In recent years, the cost for the election have been higher for a variety of reasons. The costs coming from the county have increased significantly. And those costs are allocated throughout the city based upon how many city council seats are being filled, how many rent control board seats are being filled. If everybody, I don't know if you're also hearing the echo, but if you are, maybe if everybody can mute. You guys mute. Yeah, because I think it's the reverberation of hearing me through I know, your... Because I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so well, anyway... The reason... today. <laughs> Thank you. So the reason our cost increase really is because the cost increased from the county. It was more expensive, I suppose, this year to hold the election. You know, they had to make changes to deal with the public health situation. And I think we've learned that we will need to allocate more going forward than the 25,000 we had previously allocated for that. So, okay, that's a good, yeah, that's, that's helpful. And I also think it's helpful when members of the public are considering, um, you know, things like what I would consider to be frivolous recall elections that you think about uh, how expensive that is and how expensive it was, um, you know, even just to fill our two normal vacant seats uh, across a citywide election. So um, thanks for that. And then my other questions were just like, overall, maybe you can just su summarize. Uh, w would you say that we saved money in the supplies and expenses category for the other items like these office supplies, meetings and travels, trainings, et cetera, because everything was being held remotely? Um, and is it cheaper to hold a meeting on blue jeans than it is to hold it in the chambers? Uh, the answer to that question is no, because they are still televised, so we're still paying the cable costs. Um, even though they are also available on blue jeans, we have had them uh, televised. Yes, we have saved in other things like office supplies and, um, and training, because there were not opportunities for training. The board wasn't able to go to Housing California. It was held remotely this year. So, um, so we did have some savings, as I mentioned, in the supplies and expenses category. Hopefully some of those things will change. We'll have the opportunity for more uh, training, uh, in-person training going forward. And we always encourage our staff members to participate in training. Um, Housing California is being held remotely again, so again, we won't have those travel costs. And we've made slight adjustments in those line items to account for both that and uh, reduced uh, office supplies. Sure. Okay. Thank. I know that sounds mundane, but thanks for the attention to detail. Really appreciate it. Yes, Miss Noseworthy is very attentive to all of the details, and I can't thank her enough for the effort she puts into it. Okay. I see uh, Commissioner Foster had her hand up, and then I had a question for. Um, Director Condon as well. Go ahead, Commissioner Foster. Thank you. Uh, in regards to the election costs, um, isn't it true that we are the only board in town that does not have it in our our charter or body of law that if there are no if there's no opposition to the number of seats who have filed to run, we are still forced to have an election and uh, and pay for those costs. Isn't it true that we could amend the charter at a future date to change that? Yes, I'm very glad that you raised that issue. Um, it's actually the state education code that provides that a school district or a college district doesn't need to hold an election if there are only as many candidates as there are seats open. As you point out, our charter says that we will participate in a, an election uh, no matter what. 
And so there were a couple of years in the past where we only had as many candidates as we had seats, but we still had to participate in the election and um, pay those costs. So it would require an amendment to the charter to change that, and I would certainly want the board's general counsel to be able to evaluate whether that was a wise step but I believe what happens in the education situation is the remaining uh, electeds appoint the people who are applying, have filed to fill those seats. We have occasions where we have three board members being elected, which would only leave two seats filled, and that might complicate it for us. But it's a very good point that you raise and certainly something that we could consider as a possible charter amendment. Well, thanks for that question. It was helpful, Anastasia. Yes, thank yes. you. Thank you. I, and I have a question um, for you. Uh, with the idea that that um, more remote working is is going to be in the future, it, it sounds, um, would that have an effect or could it have an effect on those expenses for office space or um, yeah, I don't know, maybe, I mean, you certainly have a better idea. I'm just wondering, if more people are working from home, do we need as many offices or, or a place, you know, to rent? That kind of thing. Right. Yeah, I think that's another legitimate question. Um, this is going to be a year of transition, and you, you know that the city just recently completed City Hall East, where they have added space and provided, um, they've eliminated all of the leases that they had for exterior or rentals where they had staff, city staff located um, off-site and they were paying leases. Fortunately for us, we don't have any, we use all of our spaces within City Hall. But the need for all city departments could, the space needs for all city departments could be affected by teleworking and I think at this point, it's early for us to, you know, assess whether we could change the amount of space that we have. Um, but I think going forward, that is certainly something that we will, you know, evaluate as we figure out what the proper mix is of teleworking and on-site staff members. So for now, the coming year, we don't see any changes, but that could change in the future. But you're right, that would affect our indirect costs because uh, those costs in large part, as you see from the itemization, are based upon, in many cases, the square footage that we um, operate in in City Hall. Understood. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, any other questions by my fellow commissioners? No? Okay. Uh, Director Condon, is there more to your uh, report? Yeah, I, I'll just give you a couple more things about the expenditures, and then we can look at the revenue projections. Um, so in this year's budget, under legal expenses, uh, we propose allocating $15,000 for legal expenses. This covers uh, the direct costs of litigation, document delivery to the courts, outside counsel if needed, depositions, and potential legal liabilities. Um, if the board's legal fees are higher than 15000 which we don't anticipate this year, the board does have a designated reserve of approximately $42,000 for legal expenses. And with the board's um, authorization, we could move those funds into the current year's uh, budget. Finally, um, in the area of service agreements, uh, with the agency in the process of transitioning from our legacy rent database to our new Infor-based system, we have to maintain service agreements on both systems. But once we've made that cutover, we anticipate that uh, the allocation in this area will be about $15,000 less going forward. And finally, in the capital outlay section of the budget, uh, we've allocated $48,400 which in addition to covering physical modifications to the public counter and staff area, work areas, 
uh, the cost of computer-related purchases, and the lease of our copier. This includes $15,500 in payments for partition participation in the city's computer equipment replacement program. This provides for computer replacements every four years for our staff members, which um, ensures that the agency is able to take advantage of newer computer technology and maintain functionality with the rest of the city departments. So Lyman and I are happy to answer any other questions you have about the expenditures. And if there aren't any, then I'll move on to the projected revenue. All right, so I'm going to share my screen again to show you and the public uh, information about our projected revenue. So total revenue projected for 21-22 is approximately $5,284,000 based upon a $198 per unit registration fee. This year, we're projecting billing approximately 26,565 units, which is um, a slight increase over previous years. And this is attributable both to the board's monitoring program of owner-occupied exempt properties and the 109 controlled units in the new development at the former Village Trailer Park site that are now being offered for lease. We also anticipate collecting approximately $6,000 of past due fees from previous years for a total of $5,266,000 in registration fees. During the year, as certain units become eligible for fee waivers or are granted exemptions, refunds are issued to owners. We anticipate refunds of about $9,000 which is a little bit less than in previous years because we've, uh, those refunds have decreased. The result, this results in registration fee revenue of $5,257,000. The other major source of revenue in previous years has been interest earnings on city invested rent control funds. This source has contributed less to our revenue in recent years due to low interest rates. The city treasurer is again estimating a rate of return on invested funds of just a half percent, resulting in anticipated interest earnings of just $21,000. The other sources of revenue are fairly de minimis and include $2,000 for administrative record charges, $2,200 in filing fees, mostly for exemption applications and $1,800 in miscellaneous charges, all together totaling $8,000. With total projected revenue of $5,284,000 and projected expenses of $5,505,000, the proposed budget projects a deficit of approximately $221,000. As I mentioned earlier, the deficit will be covered by the board's reserves, which are sufficient to both cover the deficit, and meet the city's recommended policy of retaining in reserves approximately 12% of the current operating expenditure budget and funds to cover earned leave accruals for all staff members. So finally, I want to thank Ms. Noseworthy for her dedicated, excellent, many hours of work on preparing the budget and maintaining the budget. And uh, Ms. Noseworthy and I are available to answer any questions. And then after that, if you would uh, vote to set the matter for public hearing and adoption on June 10th, that will complete this item. Well, I'm ready for a motion. You answered my questions. OK. Um, any other commissioners have any more any discussion items they want to discuss? OK. Um, Commissioner Trosis, you have the floor to make a motion if you like. Um, I move to uh, adopt the report as presented by Director Condon and set this for a public hearing on June 10th. Second. OK, there's a first and a second. Um, may we call the vote? Yes, uh, Commissioner Phyllis. Yes. Commissioner Foster. Yes. Commissioner Torosis. Yes. And Vice Chair Duran. Yes. Motion carries.
Um, point of, sorry, point of inquiry really quickly. Um, Director Condon, do you want us to keep these or is there a better a way to recycle? Like, I just don't want to be wasteful. I know we haven't been able to recycle things. And Mr. Ho, I have a lot of folders piling up here that you keep bringing over to my house. I don't, I don't know what if, should I do like an exchange and like leave out? <laughs> well, it was before all the time that Lana used to collect uh, all of our bound materials and accordion folders at every meeting, Alvin. So we may have but to discuss there. that. Alan's right. We need to conserve resources. So I would just say, if you can keep the budget books for now, if there are any modifications or if I update the memo, um, Mr. Ho will deliver that to you for your June packet. Um, and he can then pick up all of the other folders that you've been accumulating. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I want to mention to you and the public that there's a possibility that we'll be able to hold the June meeting in the council chamber. Um, the city council is moving toward holding their first public meeting in the chambers on June 8th. And assuming that goes well, um, they've made modifications in the chamber to provide for a safe uh, meeting for the people on the dais and for the public. And if we can hold the public hearing in person for both the budget um, and the general adjustment, I think that would be wonderful. It would probably mean that the members of the public would sit outside in the lobby area and would come into the chambers to provide public comment one at a time. But as we get closer to that date, we'll know whether or not we're able to use the chamber. And um, if anybody has concerns about that, please let me know about that. But I think it would be great if that would be good timing for us to return to the council chamber if we can. So I'll, I'll provide more information to you and the public about that as we get closer to that date. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, do we have item 12? We have item 12D. Is everybody ready for that one? Okay, moving on 12D, revision of the public information manager and hearings manager classification specifications. Um, can we get a report, um, Director Condon? I was going to do that report this evening. I'm sorry, okay. Go ahead, Mr. Cassell. Good evening, Commissioners. So the classification specifications for the public information manager and the hearings manager position were last updated in 2012. And the current uh, job specifications require two years of leading and coordinating the work of others as minimum qualifications for the positions. They also reference the pre-supervisory academy offered through the Santa Monica Institute, which is the city's in-house training arm, as a way of satisfying one year of the two-year management uh, requirement. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic and resulting city restructuring, the Santa Monica Institute is no longer offering in-person classes. And many of its former offerings, including the Pre-Supervisory Academy, have been discontinued. The Public Information Manager and Hearings Manager job specifications thus need to be revised to remove the Pre-Supervisory Academy option. We have consulted with the city's Human Resources Department about revising the specifications. And HR advised that in addition to removing the reference to the Pre-Supervisory Academy, they would recommend reducing the management experience requirement for both jobs in order to attract a broader range of applicants. They also recommended that the, the classification specifications emphasize subject matter expertise in rent control and housing issues over management experience, as that is the most important element in both positions. In addition, reducing required management experience will further uh, the city's equity and inclusion goals by broadening the potential applicant pool, and will also create a potential career path for existing staff who have a great deal of rent control knowledge, but might not have, uh, or might have limited management experience, given the agency's relative uh, small size and uh, limited opportunities for supervisorial assignments. 
Enhancement opportunities for current staff members are encouraged and for people interested in gaining knowledge of the principles and practices of management and supervision, funds for training are included in each year's uh, budget. We agree with the approach recommended by HR and have revised the classification specifications to remove the requirement of two years of experience leading and coordinating the work of others. The revised sections on education, training, experience, uh, state that experience leading and coordinating the work of others is desirable, but it is no longer required minimum qualification. The revised specifications also emphasize that experience with rent control and housing issues in the public sector is highly desirable. The proposed specifications for each position are attached to your packets and they are marked up to show the changes from the versions approved in 2012, underlining the strikeouts. And staff recommends that the board approve the attached classification specifications for the public information manager and hearings manager positions. That's the report. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Costello. Commissioner Trosis, do you have a question? I do for Mr. Costello. Thank you for your diligence. Appreciate it. Um, I. I am only coming to this from my singular, you know, viewpoint here of, of the county government hiring process, which I'm pretty familiar with. Can you just tell me how does the rent control board evaluate when you say what something's desirable, quote unquote, and we're concerned about these equity goals? Like, is there an evaluation mechanism for that, or it's just hi, I'm letting people know who, like who we want to apply, and hopefully we'll attract some good people. Well, the, the, first of all, the intent of, um, of saying that something is, you know, desirable, which doesn't make it a, an absolute requirement. But often, uh, when we've heard from HR that when, um, a certain skill is identified as desirable, uh, that can, um, obviously attract people with those skills, but it could also, uh, dissuade some people from applying because they think that that's actually a requirement that you're you're stating as a as a desirable characteristic um, so that's why we um, we moved to saying think are more desirable than required uh, there is a the city does have a kind of a rating system um, right for, so, so what's the exam process for both of these is it just an interview? Uh, if things are the same as they were, they, they, it's usually uh, a couple of interviews, one uh, a panel interview and then one uh, within the department itself. Okay. Um, because I assume that you rank people when, they, when you do the initial interview and then based on that. I, I just wasn't sure, actually. I mean, I probably should ask these questions generally, but I thought, Tracy, that we, isn't there the, the rule of, of five or whatever that we're trying to reduce and there's the ballot and I'm just asking like what's our process for the rent control board to hire folks yes we use the city's um, human resources oops let me see let's see and some anybody Sarah, you, please? sorry <laughs> um, we use the city's human uh, resources department to and their uh, analysts to help with this recruitment process. Generally, they will do the initial screening uh, and they will now make a special effort to reach, reach out to a broader um, group or identify as many opportunities to advertise these for us. They do the initial screening to meet the minimum qualifications required and then they will look at what we've indicated as desirable or high, highly desirable and use those to help uh, rate the employees because you're right they create bands of employees they don't do the top three but whoever meets the qualifications the highest will be in the first band and then there are other bands and depending upon the number of people that fall within those bands they then will invite people to participate in the initial interview, which is usually a panel of people. And we have the opportunity to uh, help select the people that will serve on the panel. 
we often we are very helpful in that way in that we identify people that we know who will know what we're looking for. And then after the panel does their interviews, then they rank them, and then that's when the hiring person gets to see the top three, or it, I believe. Now, I haven't done this process very recently. Mr. Costello has done it most recently, so he might have something to add to that. You're on mute. Some of, uh, some of the, um, the the, the things that were in the municipal code regarding hiring were changed at the last election. Um, so I don't think they yeah. okay. go with just the top three now. There's, um, it, it was, you know, generally part of the city's effort, you know, towards equity inclusion to take out some of these hard, you know, requirements and, and allow perhaps maybe a more subjective choice in, uh, yeah. in hiring. Thanks. No, I, I, I only ask these things because I, I've had experience with what we have at the county, which is a rule of five. And if you have five or more people in band one, you cannot move to the second band to consider folks until you've cleared that list and come up with a reason why you can't hire any of those five people. So I was just asking these questions. And so sorry if these seemed like I was vague, vaguely asking questions. I was trying to figure out if making these changes has a material impact on what's going to happen with the ranking process. And it does sound like even though we write desired qualifications, they do have some sort of uh, impact in, in how these folks are ranked. That's that's the only reason I was asking these questions. Um, and then I guess my other last comment, sorry, I, I know this seems mundane, but what is a Juris Doctor or, a, or equivalent from an accredited law school? It's in both of them, and I just don't know that there is an equivalent. So I'm like, are you saying if someone's from out of country and they're trying to apply, is that why we wrote it? You know, I, I, I'm not sure about I that, but that I think are, there, are there not other, uh, um, uh, I, I'm not sure all uh, law schools issue juris doctors. That, um, they better, they better, otherwise they're not going <laughs> to law school. I mean, I don't know. Um, I, I have never heard of an equivalent other than someone who's coming from a foreign country and they might call it something like a barrister from the UK or something like that. I don't know. Do you know, Ms. Nalaboff, um, what resulted in us having that language? Well, it, it's not something we added recently. It's been in there. And I suppose somebody could make a case if they have an LLM or something that they want to apply with, it's not something we've ever seen, anything other than a JD. Okay, I was just asking. Um, other than that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty well fine with this. I still feel like these are pretty broad, so you, it's really just, you know, who, who are the folks that are applying, and I understand that you want to cast a wide net, so I get it. Um, and yes, succession planning and opportunity for advancement from within, very important, so I really appreciate that you're thinking about that. Thanks. Okay, um, any other comments, discussion from other commissioners? Seeing none, um, I'll entertain a, a motion. I think that's what we need at this point, right? Yes. Uh, anyone want to make a motion? Um, I'll move that we accept staff's report and revise the public information manager and hearings manager classification specifications. Okay, very good. Um, I, I will second that. Um, if there's no other discussion, then we can move to a roll call vote. Yes, uh, Commissioner Phyllis. Yes. Commissioner Foster. Yes. Commissioner Kloses. Yes. And Vice Chair Duran. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, very good. Um, I want to remind everyone that the next meeting is scheduled for June 10th, 2021 at 7 p.m. Um, I guess it's to be determined whether we will be doing it um, via teleconference or in person, so stay tuned with that. 
Um, other than that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay, who's going to first? And a second from okay. Commissioner Trosis. Okay, roll call vote. Yes, uh, Commissioner Foster? Yes. Commissioner Trosis? Yes. Commissioner Phyllis? Yes. And Vice Chair Grill? Yes, and thank you all, and thank you for your patience with me this evening. Have a great month, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye-bye.